Future Tense. Future Tense is a partnership of New America, Slate, and Arizona State University. And our goal is to explore emerging technologies and their implications for public policy and for society. We do this in two ways. We have a channel on Slate where we add daily commentary and news about technology. And we like to get together in real life uh, it, with live events here in Washington and in New York. We actually have two upcoming events that you might be interested in. On October 5th, we'll be discussing World Without Mind, the Existential Threat of Big Tech, which is by Franklin Four. Um, that'll start at 6 p.m. And on Tuesday, October 17th, we'll have a conversation with journalist Liza Mundy about her new book, Code Girls, which explores the secret history of female code breakers during World War II. Um, a couple more quick housekeeping notes. Um, please silence your cell phones. That was in my notes before that cell phone, for the record. Um, also, this event is streaming live on the New America website, so um, when we get to the Q&A, please wait until the microphone comes to you to ask a question. Otherwise, people watching online won't be able to hear it. So we're here today to talk about mental health and tech. And like many of you, I'm sure, um, finding ways to improve our mental health care system is a very personal issue for me. My mother suffered through much of her adult life from poorly controlled bipolar disorder. And for a very long time, I, or over the course of the years, I developed a kind of kludgy system to try to, try to monitor her mental health myself. So um, I looked for emails sent at strange hours. I looked for rambling run-on sentences and weird punctuation. I took note of her voicemails. Um, was she sort of quick and breezy, or did she ramble on for three minutes about something I couldn't quite follow? Um, but maybe the best indicator for me of her mental health was Netflix. So I could tell if she was watching a lot of alien and angel and plane crash documentaries that we might be in for a bumpy ride. Um, if she repeatedly started a bunch of shows and movies in a row and couldn't commit to something, I knew she was having difficulty focusing. And so those little cues would help me kind of keep on top of things. Um, and if I hadn't heard from her in a couple of days, I would check Netflix, and if I could see that she'd been watching something, I knew she was alive, which was really useful. So my monitoring might have been kludgy and uneven, but it wasn't completely out of line. Today we're here to talk about using technology just for that, to help monitor as well as diagnose and treat mental illness. We're such creatures of habit, particularly when it comes to our personal devices. They can monitor, um, they notice maybe when the train is just barely starting to go off the rails. Your phone's GPS sensor can tell us whether you've left the house recently. Um, changes to text patterns could indicate depression or anxiety or even psychosis. And that's just passive data collection. Researchers like those here today are also using virtual reality to help treat people with PTSD and with phobias. Technology also offers patients new ways to stay in touch with each other and to offer each other peer support, which is crucial for people who might be inclined to retreat into themselves. And while this is all very exciting, it's also, as many of you know, extremely preliminary. And particularly when it comes to data collection, there are enormous privacy concerns. So today we'll discuss what is actually possible when it comes to using tech to, to treat and diagnose mental health problems. So let's get started with our first conversation. Um, speakers, when I say your name, please join me on the stage. Uh, so first we have David Dobbs, who is an award-winning journalist whom I've been editing for about 10 years now, who writes features and essays on blindness, transplants, neuroscience, and mental health. He's written for National Geographic, The New York Times, and for Slate, and recently wrote about mental health and tech for The Atlantic and for Pacific Standard, a piece that comes out on Tuesday, I believe. John Taurus is the co-director of the Digital Psychiatry Program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where he's also a staff psychiatrist and clinical informatics fellow. He serves as editor-in-chief for the leading academic journal on tech and mental health, and leads the APA's work group on the evaluation of smartphone apps. And then we have Stephen Chan, who is UC San Francisco's inaugural clinical informatics fellow and an actively practicing physician in psychiatry and behavioral sciences, specializing in mood, anxiety, PTSD, attention, and psychotic disorders. He uh, also researches in the areas of digital mental health and applications for cultural psychiatry and underserved minority health. He also designed and developed interactive voice interfaces at Microsoft, which is pretty cool.
So I think to start off, um, John, I was wondering if you could maybe give us kind of a lay of the land. So what are the different sorts of technologies we're talking about here? Yeah. So I think it's wonderful to be here. And I said to all of you online, hello. <laughs> I said, I think mental health technology is a really exciting space right now. There's so much happening and there's so much potential. And I think it's always interesting to say what's possible, where are we now, and how are we getting there? So I think without ranting for a couple days and going on and on, I think we're at a point now where we, a lot of people have smartphones, wearables, different sensors. I said, not everyone. Some people are still excluded, they may not have technology, but we're getting to a point where a society, people have access to these phones and sensors, and because of that, we can collect a lot of information very easily now. I said, we can send surveys about mental health on phones. The phones, by virtue of being phones, can collect a lot of information about where we are, who we call, how we use them, who we're nearby. I'm not gonna talk about virtual reality because we have an expert speaker who's gonna talk about all those, but we can certainly do a lot of things that may augment or improve mental health. And I think, but we're at, the, we're at the early stage that we're now collecting all this digital data, we're learning what it means, and we're saying, here's what we've been doing before, it may be working well or not, but we have all this new data, all these new things, how do they really work? What works well, what doesn't work well? What's safe, what's effective, what doesn't work well? And, I think I'll just say, just because we can collect all this digital data doesn't inherently mean it's gonna be valuable in itself. It has to be proven. Just like we can collect the entire genetic code today, you can know every gene in my sequence, and that doesn't mean that you know who I am, it doesn't mean you know my personality, it doesn't know mean you know my predilection to mental illness. Having the information is a great first start, but now we have to do our due diligence and kind of say, what does it mean, how should we use it, and what are the best ways? So that's my, Fast summary. <laughs> and so what different kinds of technologies are we talking about here? So the apps to, to diagnose, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that? So at least the way I try to break it up is we can kind of make two artificial buckets, but apps are working more on the diagnostic and monitoring side, and apps and technology working more on the therapeutic and intervention side. If we're looking at the diagnostic and monitoring side, thinking of just the smartphones, you can almost think of three use cases. The first could be we're sending surveys, so active data. You have to actively respond to that survey. If you don't take that survey, there's no response. And that requires participation, and we can talk about later. If you send me a survey every day, I'm gonna stop taking it eventually. But that's just, maybe that's just me, maybe that's human nature. We can also collect on this diagnostic monitoring bucket passive data, and by passive data we mean we can collect sensors from the phone. So we can kind of, the phone by virtue of being a phone knows where you are, by sending a text message, it knows that you were sending a message to someone. It may know how many characters it was. It may know that I'm calling the same person 20 times a day. It may know I'm not calling my mother enough. It may know I'm calling her too much. <laughs> I won't disclose that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of sensor information, the phone being a phone. There may be this kind of idea of a digital phenotyping, a term that J.P. O'Nella coined, of kind of these digital biomarkers, these digital signals, digital fingerprints, of what could be certainly happening. And I said again, just because we can collect those digital fingerprints doesn't mean that they're inherently gonna be useful. There's a lot of work to kind of refine them and say what they could do. We can certainly talk about now in the therapeutic bucket, even just as I said, looking at smartphone apps, there's a lot of different things that technology can do from helping scheduling appointments to medication reminders to offering augmented forms of therapy, offering cognitive behavioral therapy on a phone you could certainly offer mindfulness. I would argue if your smartphone is buzzing, telling you it's time to be mindful, get your phone out, just be mindful right now. You missed your mindfulness. That, that, that may be counterproductive, but it may work for some people. And I think that's part of the question is, who do we target these things to? Who's gonna respond best to a technology intervention? Who is it gonna be not useful for? I think overarching both buckets of diagnostic and monitoring, there's a question too of, Who's seeing your data? You're giving up a lot of personal data about yourself. You're saying, I may have a mental illness, I may take this medication, I may be in this location, this is where I sleep, this is where I work, these are my friends, this is my social network. And it's certainly, when you go to a psychiatrist, a therapist, a mental health office, you're protected, you're, there's HIPAA, there's federal privacy laws that help protect your information. And I said a lot of times, these digital things you may be using don't offer those same protections. 
It looks like health care, but it's actually in a different bucket. There's less federal regulations, there's less protection. So in using these services, what are you giving up? And sometimes I tell patients, or the price of a free app may be your personal mental health information. And that's not a judgment whether you should use it or not, but you should at least be aware of what is the contract you're signing. You should be able to make an informed decision about it. So again, there's a lot of great stuff out there. What you're giving up to use it is certainly unknown. And one project with the American Psychiatric Association that Steve Chan and I do is we've been working on what's a rubric or evaluation to help you make an informed decision about a smartphone app. So we're not going to tell you this app is good, this app is bad, because it depends on the situation. And even if Steve and I could rank every app out there together, if we spent a year looking at all 10,000 apps, by the time we finished, they'd all update. <laughs> and everything that we ranked for you guys would not be useful. And if just like there's no A plus therapy, you don't say therapy X is the one to do, or you don't say medication Y is the one to do, or exercise plan Z is the best one, these are personal decisions. So it's very hard to kind of say, this app is the app to do. It's dynamic, it's changing, it needs to be personalized. So with the American Psychiatric Association, we've been working to help people think, what are some questions you should ask when you're looking at a new technology can help you make informed decision? And I said, so we're not gonna say, again, use this or not, but just to be aware of what is the privacy and safety, what is the efficacy, what is the evidence behind it, is it usable, is it something you can stick with, is there interoperability? Will data get back to the right people? Or are you actually fragmenting your care because you're telling one app what your medicines are, one app is doing your therapy, one app is doing appointment reminders, and no one has any idea where your treatment, where your health care is heading. So, um, I really want to get back to the question about privacy and security because I think that's an important one. Um, but I'm also glad that you mentioned how personal this is and, and how things that are designed for one person might not work for somebody else. And, Steve, I know you've been involved with thinking about how these apps are designed and bringing patients into the process. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, what, so one of the things that's, uh, that's really, really interesting about having technology uh, in mental health is that it really increases access to so many people. When I trained in Sacramento, Sacramento is the capital of California, and they had all sorts of ethnics, uh, uh, ethnic uh, variety of folks. Um, I, I worked at a Pan-Asian clinic where we had so many different languages, Hmong, Vietnamese, Laotian, um, Cambodian, Chinese, et cetera. And having, uh, what, what we noticed was that um, just having it, the ability to access mental health has been a challenge for them. We'd have to manually drive out to take them out to, uh, take folks out to outings, take them to, take folks out to their appointments. Um, and so designing interventions that works with not just um, their ability to use smartphones, but also their culture and their language and understanding, understanding those aspects is important. So part of the American Psychiatric Association criteria is, you know, how usable are these technologies? Because as John alluded to, you know, you can have surveys and bug people with surveys, but then they won't uh, want to come back and use those applications. Um, similar thing with uh, virtual reality is my, my understanding is that, uh, you know, if, if it causes some dizziness or a vertigo as well, then people are less likely to use it. But uh, if it's, um, you know, usable and it's easy to use and someone is helping them and coaching them to use, use the technology, then uh, they're more likely to accept it. So having the usability piece is absolutely important for these apps and devices. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think I read recently somewhere that um, India has 1.3 billion people and 5,000 psychiatrists. Um, uh, yeah. We have 25,000 psychiatrists in the U.S. So you, know, you can see how, as Tom Insel says in a, a piece that David wrote for The Atlantic recently, we can't get as many psychiatrists as we need. So, but I mean, I guess, I'm, and I'm interested in what any of you think about this. Um, how can you scale up what so far seems to be very small efforts? Yeah, with, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, with India specifically the shortage of mental health professionals, and this we see this in the developing world. There was an article in Health Affairs a few years ago that said that the ratio of smartphones to mental health professionals is quite high, and so could we use those smartphones uh, as a way to deliver uh, therapeutics? Another thing to consider, and I will just leave it, leave the audience with this uh, thought, 
is that if you look at any sort of mental health professional, they do a whole variety of different tasks, um, such as not just scheduling someone, but interviewing them, diagnosing, assessing, then treating. Can you split those tasks up and have other folks do different pieces, um, such as the education part? Could you, say, use an application or some sort of website that delivers that education for them or gives them homework, too? So splitting that up can potentially make use, more efficient use of a uh, limited resource, um, which is the mental health professional. I don't know if that's been your impression with uh, Dr. Insel's work? Or? Yeah, so Doc, Tom Insel, uh, I wrote a profile of him for the um, Atlantic in the July issue, and he was for 13 years uh, the head of the National Institute of Mental Health and got restless partly because the work they did there uh, there was such a long lag and uncertainty whether the work they would do there would actually help patients. He, was, he gave a talk once and someone in the room got impatient and said, you don't get it. Uh, our house is on fire and you're talking about the chemistry of the paint. And so that helped inspire him to move to uh, Google temporarily where he headed the mental health team at, a, at, their, at Verily, which is their health unit. Um, and started to create, plan out, and start to build out a uh, mental health effort there based on collecting smartphone technology and then trying to figure out how they might use that to help patients. So one model he used was, uh, he actually, this was started by a woman named Danielle Slosher at UCSF, now at Verily, um, and it was a program, an app called Prime, and it was for people who had had first psychotic episodes. And there were about 50 people in the group, and at any given time, two or three, sometimes more, um, professionals, not all of them therapists, but different levels. And the idea was that this group would give these people a safe place, private but open, if you will, uh, where they, were all, they could share with peers. And I think one thing that's easy to overlook the potential of here is the power of the smartphone simply to connect people who are suffering from a given mental problem or challenge together so that they can compare notes. Uh, this is of tremendous value to people who have had psychosis because the first thing that happens when you become psychotic is your entire social network falls apart in about 10 minutes. Um, so I saw this at work there, and it worked in a very interesting way. They had one example where a, a guy uh, who wouldn't have spoken up ordinarily, he said, um, spoke up in this group because it was safe. He was feeling a little different. They ran some algorithms to look at whether his syntax in his text were changing. They were, and they upped his medication, and he stabilized. Now, no control, maybe he would have stabilized anyway, but this is one model of how it would work fairly low um, labor cost from the, from the psychiatrist there, right? Uh, you, he didn't need a psychiatrist to do all that. He kind of brought it himself. And another instance uh, where I've seen, talked to someone where this worked, was a woman named Nev Jones, who is in the story that's coming out next week uh, that I wrote for Pacific Standard, who was a grad student in philosophy when she had her first psychotic episode one thing after another was bungled and it was, she went to hell and came back out. But part of what got her back out was with a simple Google group on her own, uh, she built a network of other academics who had had psychotic episodes. And some were still, some were undergrads, some were grad students, postdocs, and some were professors. And simply by connecting to other people who, want, who were doing what she wanted to do, this was a tremendous boost to her, and she credits it, along with a really good therapist <laughs> and a good psychiatrist with helping her uh, get out of the well. I think this points to the idea that these are packages, these are kind of broader interventions than just technology, or certainly technology in this case is a useful mediator, but even in Prime that they developed, if you look, it's people supporting it. I said you can't just kind of buy the app itself is just an app. It's a piece of code or technology. It's the fact that there's people behind it. It's connecting people. That, that's what's different. I think so. You, in some ways, you say 
well, is this gonna be cost effective? It's hard to know because what if we need now more people to support this, to monitor it? So I said, is the question, are we just kind of, we know that human connection, one-on-one -on -one talking, these are helpful things for mental health, for all of health, and are we using technology in this case to kind of just facilitate connections happening, which is a good thing, is that gonna be a scalable solution that's gonna be cost effective that we can deploy globally or is this gonna be, we have another layer to kind of connect people to? I think these are questions we're learning. We don't have, yeah. we don't have the answer to. And at, at Verily, they see it very much that way, that this is a, a, a small in experiment to a feasibility thing. And before everyone or anyone rushes off to try to sign up for Prime, I should say, <laughs> it's not even beta, it's alpha. It's a research project. So it's, you know, it's not open as it were. It's, it's an experiment. Yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in the fact that Google, and I think in your piece you say that five to ten companies in Silicon Valley are involved with the space in some way. Uh, at, at least that, and probably might be more, more since I closed the story. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, sh is that something that we should be sort of excited about, or is it something we should maybe be a little trepidatious about? <laughs> you know, we've seen Silicon Valley likes to move fast and break things, but when things are people's minds, that can be a little bit scary. Uh, I think all of the above. <laughs> uh, my, my take on this, having written about it from several different angles and been around the uh, mental health world actually all my life because my mother was a psychiatrist. No joke, please. Um, <laughs> uh, is You're in that, a safe space here. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that, that there, th there's tremendous potential here for good and tremendous potential to really screw things up because uh, I, we've talked about some of the good this can do. It's got huge challenges. How do you scale, let's say Prime was perfect. Still, how do you scale it up? It's 50 patients, half a dozen people at least running it. How do you, how do you scale that up? But there's, uh, the, the sort of bomb we can't overlook here is, is the privacy issue, which um, I wrote a piece for Slate that was out, what, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, that was only three days, two days ago. Um, about how bad the firewalls around our medical information are. There were 112 million patient records leaked last year by insurance companies, breaches, uh, a lot of them hacks, trying to get the data to, to do as a ransom, to ransom them or other means. And a, about an equal number in 2016 and 2015, over 100 million. This is an Equifax scale leak of medical information occurring every year already. So, and this is from places that, some of them, the health insurance companies that are ruled by HIPAA. This new sector, it's unclear where HIPAA applies and where it doesn't. Uh, John did a wonderful study, just the dementia apps, hardly any privacy uh, uh, strictures on those. And it seems to me, this, this stuff is so explosive. There can't be, I mean, the blow, it could cripple the thing before it got started and it would be irresponsible not to have it ready. So what our team did is with Ipsit, Bahia, and Lisa Rosenfeld is we actually took all of the top dementia apps on the commercial marketplaces and we printed out those privacy policies. And we actually read all the privacy policies to see what information are people giving up their rights to when they're using apps that are collecting personal health information about dementia. And you can imagine someone with dementia may have a difficult time in the first place understanding a privacy policy, but in some ways it didn't matter because over half the apps had no privacy policy. So the, the companies that were making these apps didn't even bother to put out a signpost and say, here's how we're using your data. Of the less than half that even offered a privacy policy to tell you what's happening to your personal, your de dementia data, most of them didn't offer very protections that people would want to know. And you almost say, if we can't put out good signposts that tell people what's happening to your data, that's not a good place to start. I said healthcare, especially mental health, is based on transparency and trust. You can tell and disclose very sensitive things that you wouldn't tell to other people. If we're now offering in a world where we're trying to hide the fact that information is being collected about you, we're not even going to tell you what's going to happen to your data, that's not the foundation to build this on. And I said, if we do build this on a foundation of not telling you we're collecting your health information, marketing it, selling it, people aren't gonna 
be honest with these devices. People aren't going to use them how we want, and we're not going to, it's not going to be helpful. So I think we're at a very, very early stage in terms of that, and I think we'll know that it feels really maturing when we see that we're having honest conversations about what information about you are we collecting, where is it going, who is it seeing, how do you have access to your own information. It shouldn't be that someone's collecting it and selling it and making money because you have a mental illness. So to what extent are, are apps in this space actually regulated by the FDA right now? Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, right now, um, with these apps, uh, the FDA is being overwhelmed with a lot of these apps. They've only been able to approve a handful of apps. In fact, I think only uh, one app in the mental health space uh, for substance use disorders has been approved in uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, just, well, I'm sorry? Reset? That, Reset, yeah. I think by pair therapeutics. Um, but since then, they've decided that they'll, instead of certifying individual apps, which you know, we mentioned that these apps can change at any moment. It's not like a book where we can write a book and then publish it, and it's frozen in time. Uh, if we review an app, it can continuously change, and there are all these different uh, permissions. The, po the walls are quite porous. So they instead are certifying the, the developers and saying, well, are the developers practicing things in a way that's sound and clinically uh, helpful? Um, and I think that their mentality is that with these apps, that they're low risk. They're not diagnosing something that they deem as acute or critical like an EKG would. Um, but at the same time, you know, with mental health, you know, I mean, John, you've seen some of, of these studies where uh, apps would say, recommend things like, oh, if you're anxious, you should grab a yeah. bottle of alcohol, <laughs> <All> right? <laughs> I think you, we've seen yeah. stuff like that, too. And sometimes, too, there's, un there's unintended consequences. We're using new technologies, new platforms to reach people. And one study of very good intentions was to help cut down on college drinking. There was an app. And they would have students say how much they drank, and the app would then say, you know, you've reached your limit for today. You should cut back, and that makes sense. And then they went back and said, what's happening? What, what's actually happening that we released this app on college? And they said, people are drinking more. <laughs> and they said, but, but the whole point was to tell people you, you've reached your limit. And they found that people had turned the app into a game. And the idea was, <laughs> who would get the highest score on campus to drink the most? So again, a wonderful idea for using technology. In that case, it didn't work out. But certainly having a wonderful idea is a first step, and we should explore them. And this was in a study. They were able to stop it very quickly. But I said certainly before we're rolling these things out on a national, global population level, just because it sounds good or it's a good idea, we have to say, what's going to happen? What are the unintended consequences? So in a minute, we'll move on to audience questions. But I wanted to ask one more thing first. Um, what is a digital placebo? And what does it have to do with what we're talking about here? So a digital placebo is one of my favorite terms that no one else in the world seems to love as much as <laughs> I do. <laughs> so we wrote about this term in Lancet Psychiatry a couple of years ago. And the idea is, especially in all of healthcare, but especially in mental health, behavioral health, there's a placebo effect. We realize that sometimes people get better because of the expectation of care and the expectation of treatment. And certainly when you are given an app, there's expectation you have a high-tech intervention high-tech monitoring, sensors, big data, machine learning. These are things that we actually wrote about in the recent article with, the, for, with Patrick Staples talking about this. But the idea being that there's expectations. And sometimes the fact that you think you're using an app may make you feel better. And we actually published a meta-analysis of all the depression apps in world psychiatry with Joe Ferris. It's free to access online. And we looked at, if you look at all the apps that work on depressive symptoms, you can actually see that if you, ones that have a randomized control trial, so ones that have a wait list where you just get nothing, and ones that have an active control, there's a difference. And by that I mean that the fact that if you have an active control, you feel better compared to if you have nothing. So the fact that you may have an app that's doing something, if you have a placebo app, you actually improve too. Your depressive symptoms get better. So I think it means that any time you're kind of seeing improvements in these studies or an app says we get you better, is it just the fact that there's expectations, and that's not a bad thing, but that means we really have to demand a high standard of evidence. It shouldn't just be that it made you a little bit better. It's how did it make you better compared to something else. How do you design a placebo app? 
can do things like uh, pr just basically provide some sort of education or static text or something that isn't really that interactive. Um, but placebo apps, you know, it, it, they, it's bare basics, right? Bare bones sort of um, things versus an interactive, highly interactive intervention that you can create uh, with an app. But I think the key point is making sure that when you're comparing things, you're not just comparing, um, you know, the app to nothing at all. Um, so that's something to watch out for with these studies and these research studies. Something is always better than nothing, except that alcohol app in that case. <laughs> 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 nothing was better. <laughs> Uh, and I should mention too that you know, as I said, so David and then John with uh, a co-author Patrick Staples both wrote pieces for Future Tense in the past week about mental health and tech. And if you're interested in reading them, you can find them at, at slate.com slash future tense. Highly recommend. Um, all right, I think it's time to move on to questions. Hi, my name is Lucia Savage. And not only am I a privacy expert, but my mother was also bipolar. So I had two questions for you. I'll just try to do them really quick. One is last year, HHS published kind of a definitive report for Congress on what's regulated by HIPAA and what's not regulated by HIPAA. And in this mental health space, that's particularly acute because there's this interesting interplay between state law and federal law. And I guess I'm wondering for the panelists, do you even know that that's out there? Because the government doesn't really have an advertising budget. So no, never heard of it? Anyone heard of it? You've heard of it. Yep. So we've read it, and it's actually it informed the work we did with the American Psychiatric Association because we kind of were able, it, that report outlined all the different ways that consumers or people looking at these apps may be kind of, let's say not deceived, but may kind of be giving up information they don't realize it from marketing practices, how information is stored. So it's actually freely available online as well, too. It's a white paper, but it's certainly a very good read. And I said, we'll be talking about it Actually, we have a session coming up at the APA. We have a meeting called Institute of Psychiatric Services, IPS, and we have a workshop Steve and I are doing on smartphone app evaluation. That will be one of the slides, okay. a picture of that. Second comment was um, for you. You know, AMA has this new consortia, Exertia, where they're evaluating the efficacy of apps, and there's kind of a little bit of a privacy and security piece. And is the APA work integrated with that at all, or is it sort of parallel? So. Right now, it's more parallel. I said I think we actually have recommendations on. We don't. We have. We actually have guidelines and questions that people can follow. I think the AMA work is a little more abstract right now. You can't actually bring something and kind of begin to say, does it? You. you there's no questions to ask. So I think they're in an earlier stage. And a variety of uh, associations and groups are working on these similar criteria. So the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, the ADAA, and there's also a. a Coalition of Technology in Behavioral Science, CTIBS. They also have their own criteria. So a variety of organizations are also looking at things in parallel with different philosophies. For the APA, it's primarily for clinicians. So we can say for clinicians, hey, um, here are some guidelines you can use. Um, some associations are doing things a bit more comprehensively, um, very rigorously. Some folks are doing things a bit more like a consumer reports style review. Um, hi, thank you very much. I'm Kara Smyrick. And my question is about um, the inclusion of people with lived experience of mental health conditions as part of teams uh, that create the apps. So what I've heard a lot and read a lot is that the apps are created by providers or others and then um, you know, pushed out to, to the consumer world, but there's no involvement of the actual consumer, the end user, um, in the app. So that's one, one question um, because your panel doesn't have happen to have anybody who identified <laughs> as a person with lived experience, but thank you for bringing up Nev Jones. Um, so that's one of my questions. And then um, the other question was about um, how to educate both consumers and families and the public about those privacy issues and where to look for those uh, privacy issues so that when they're signing up for these great technologies or these technologies, maybe not so great, how do they know exactly to look for that like first one thing is a privacy thing? You know, the involvement of people who are actually going to use these apps is actually critical. And I know that there's some groups that are already creating uh, these uh, programs. The National Alliance for Mental Illness, for instance, they have a variety of 
I, I know they have at least one app, but you know, using some of those principles from Prime, you know, mm -hmm. that, that uh, they actually will create it. They have a, an app called Air where they have like a mini social network and you can actually post anonymous messages and get virtual hugs and not just the likes that you'd usually get if in Facebook. Um, and I believe the Dep Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance that's also created apps as well. Um, but absolutely essential, I think, uh, too, um, that we actually use, what we actually try out what we create. I think the point you raised, Paris, is really one of the core issues because right now people don't stick with these apps. I said people may download it, but just because you download an app doesn't mean you're going to use it more than once. Just to use it once doesn't mean you're going to come back to it five times, ten times. We want these things to be engaging. I think the lack of people with lived experience is really made that these things aren't as useful. I'm lucky that I'm based out of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, so when we're building our apps that we're using in research, we actually can work with the people that we treat, and I said it, they're actually some of our harshest critics, so I'll show a screen of the app that we're making, and so people I work with say, I, I would never use that. They said, completely redesign it or make it this, and we've learned a lot by that process, and I think as we get the voice of more people with lived experience in, these things will become more usable and more effective, but it's a huge barrier, and it's a huge problem right now that you bring up. David, do you have thoughts? Yeah, yeah I think this is a, was it Kara or Karen? Karis, no, you're okay, Karis. It's, it's a good question. Uh, so this woman I profiled for uh, Pacific Standard is, this is a huge thing for her and for most people with lived experience, which for those who aren't familiar with the term, is someone who's dealt with uh, a particular mental challenge, mental illness. Um, and uh, she argues very energetically and effectively that, you know, Neff? Yeah. Um, <laughs> she's a force. Uh, she argues very energetically that input from, not input from, active full partner participation by people of lived experience needs to be the de facto state of all research and treatment efforts. And I, I um, having seen the effect uh, that she has on the efforts, many efforts she's already been involved with in her four years of work or so, uh, I can't help but be convinced she's got a real point. So this speaks to something that really needs to be more systemic, but as John was just saying, you can see the effect very quickly if you involve someone and you're designing an app that's not going to work for them, they'll let you know, and it's good to know these things. I wonder how many of those of the Silicon Valley efforts are doing this. Exactly. I'm wondering, how do you build awareness and acceptance and credibility for an app, and is, it, is an MD going to prescribe an app, or is there another way that a patient discovers that this is available to them? Yeah, I'm curious. Oh, uh, go ahead. Oh, oh so my, my initial thought was it's kind of like a, how we would recommend, say, going to a particular group. So if someone had an, uh, an issue of addiction, I'd say, no, check out Alcoholics Anonymous, or if you don't like Alcoholics Anonymous, maybe we can find uh, something that you know would suit you. Um, maybe there's a book that we could, so uh, this kind of may, perhaps shows my age, but you know here's a book that could be helpful uh, that you could that you can go on Amazon and read. And I know, I know, I know. And and and, and we we do this. We'd say, oh, here's a book. So we would also just try to explore different apps. That this is what I would do, and uh, and say, you know, would this work for you or what kind of smartphone do you use? And do you know how to you know, use it uh, on a daily basis? Um, I had a family, gosh, in an inpatient setting, and they, they, they were saying, um, how will we know our grandmother or grandfather you know, would have a relapse uh, and, uh, for their illness? Um, and I would say things like, well, check their sleep, you know, check you know, their appetite, you know, you know, if you notice any changes. And, they say, and then they told me, um, well, would a Fitbit work? And I said, well, you know, it's not medical grade, but it's, you know, helpful. It's one data point. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's part of the whole package, I, I think, in terms of what we can suggest and recommend. In, I think yeah. our first starting point is just if these apps want to work as medical treatments, medical interventions, they, again, should respect people's privacy. And pay if you have half these things don't have privacy policies, that's really a non-starter, or that's taking us down a different route. And I said, so the, again, the foundation is health is trust and transparency. 
I think anything that kind of differentiates itself, saying here's how we enforce this, here's how we are, here's why you should trust us, here's how we use your data is a really good start. And I said, you can probably get rid of half the apps out there because they don't even have a privacy policy. I said, so one question, you've got rid of half the space. And if no one actually reads the privacy policy, but though at least it suggests that the company has put thought into it, right? Is that part yeah. of it? So I said, they're yeah. not, just because they have one doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. Right? That's a screening <laughs> question only. I said, right. you can get rid of half of them that haven't even bothered to tell you. Right. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and part of it would be literacy. Too. Oh, it's, it's kind of like when we assess mm -hmm. uh, for services, like if I said, again, with the AA example, oh, you should go to an AA meeting. If they start telling me things like, I can't drive there, I can't uh, get transport or take time off, then we know that's not going to work. If someone says uh, to us, well, I want to use an app, but I don't know how the permissions system works, I don't know how to disable access to my contacts, then I'm a lot more careful about that sort of thing. I think we have. I, I, the question was, how do you, how do you spread the word? Right. Well, what I was just going to say, I think one way would, there's nothing better uh, than hearing from a friend like you that something is great. So if there can be more ways to get people with lived experience to connect with each other in a society that tends to isolate them horribly, and the sicker they are, the more they get isolated. <laughs> Uh, that would be a win right there. Uh, unfortunately, I think we have to stop it there. But thank you so much to our panelists for joining us for this. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next up, we have a presentation called Virtual Reality, Virtual, uh, Real Healing from Albert Skip Rizzo. Skip is the director of medical virtual reality at the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies and has research professor appointments with the USC Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He conducts research on the design, development, and evaluation of VR systems for clinical assessment, treatment, and rehabilitation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if my mic is working. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Um, before the question, um, how many people have actually tried virtual reality, immersive VR? Oh, okay, about half the room. Well, you're in for a treat, the other half. Um, I brought along a very simple VR headset that runs off a mobile phone. It's called the Samsung Gear VR. I'm not getting paid by Samsung to mention that. Um, and I'm going to pass it around, and you can pass it uh, back and forth. Um, and basically what you have is a spherical video of hanging from a helicopter flying over Iceland, um, just to give you an idea about the immersive properties of VR. So the way this works, you put it up to your head, and it'll sense that your head is in there. It'll start up, but you'll see a still image. You'll be able to turn your head. And this little touch pad, you just tap it. So you go like this. And now I have the still image. I can look around. But if I go like this, now I'm in a virtual spherical environment hanging from the helicopter. If you get to the end, you'll see a little curved arrow. You align. There's a crosshair. You just point at that, and it'll bring it back to the beginning. Um, so here you go. All right. So with that, um, do we have slides? Uh, here we go. Uh, here we go. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit. I've got 15 minutes. So I'm going to talk fast. And I've got a lot of, a lot of video. Um, I'm going to talk about how VR has been applied in the areas of mental health and rehabilitation. Now, this is not a new thing. Everybody's excited about VR um, because the technology has basically caught up with the vision recently, the great tech advances. But actually, there's been a ton of work going on since the mid-'90s. VR had a, had a, a period from 91 to 95, I would say, where a lot of excitement, just like today, you know, VR is going to change the world and all that. But it was a little ahead. The vision was a little ahead of its time. The technology was not mature to deliver on that. But there were some things that you could do. And so around 1995, basically, the bottom fell out of VR. Uh, it was viewed as a failed technology. But people in mental health and rehabilitation kind of hung in there. And consequently, 
over the years, the technology got better and concomitantly, the research evolved. So probably of any application area for virtual reality, mental health and rehabilitation has the most evolved psychological, um, evolved scientific literature. So with that said, uh, this is where I'm located at University of Southern California. And uh, our lab, the MedVR lab, uh, interdisciplinary group of folks. And over the years, what we've done is develop applications in psych, cognitive, motor, and virtual humans. I'll show a couple of clips here. Come on. Oh, there we go. Hold on. Let me back that up. Having a little bit of a technical slowdown here. So this is a simulation that you would see in a headset like this of Iraq or Afghanistan that we've developed over the years for treating post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans coming back from these conflicts. Basically helping patients to confront and process difficult emotional memories um, in a safe environment. Um, for a point of comparison, oh boy. That's what it looked like about seven or eight years ago. Uh, you can see the advancements in the graphics. It's gotten much better. But in this case, we're not just um, treating PTSD with the simulation. We converted it to a cognitive test. So in a military-relevant environment, maybe after a mild uh, blast injury, you could assess a person's attention, memory, executive function within a simulated environment. So as primitive as it, it may look, it was useful for that. But our work doesn't just involve military apps. This is one for mental rotation assessment and training. My background is clinical psych and neuropsych. And so we wanted to develop, this is 1997, ways to be able to test and train people's mental, cognitive, visual, spatial abilities using um, a non-immersive but highly interactive VR simulation. Under here, what you have is similar to wearing that headset. That's what a child sees as they look around in a virtual classroom. This was developed to test kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So it's an assessment tool where the child would have to pay attention to what's going on on the blackboard, but meanwhile, distractions. Teacher going to answer the door, kid in the back to a paper airplane, school bus going by. So a controlled stimulus environment for assessing attention under a range of cognitively challenging conditions. Next one is in physical therapy using a Microsoft Connect. You can capture that user's movement. She's not wearing any markers or anything like that. The camera's capturing the movement, putting it on that little avatar, and now she can interact in a game-based environment as a way to make the very boring and repetitive activities of physical or occupational therapy, say after a stroke or a brain injury, more fun and engaging. And this is all off-the-shelf consumer products. So it's not you know, just a domain of research labs. This can be put into the home so you can push more of this therapy into a home environment, get people to do it at sufficient levels. Uh, we know that doing physical rehab matters problem is people don't do enough of it to get the gains. So now taking that same technology and using it for a different purpose, Cerebral Palsy Foundation asked us to make, it, make computer games more accessible to children with severe motor impairments. So this little girl, first time she's ever played um, a video game in her life because she didn't have the motor capability to operate a game pad or a keyboard or whatever. Um, and the only movement that she had real volitional control was this movement. She could do this reliably. So the camera's tracking that movement and emulating the action of a game pad so she could play this little shark jump game. We've now evolved this so we can do things with, say, um, the, the, the full-on Xbox. So, uh, say, a, a racing game, a car racing game. Say you're in a wheelchair. If you can shift just a little bit in that chair, you can steer the car, you lean forward, you can go fast, you lean back, you can slow down. Um, now, moving into the virtual human area, come on. This is a virtual patient for training clinicians. Can we turn up the volume a little bit? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. 
She's been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicide on base last week. Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He wasn't a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. Do you have any plans to hurt yourself? No. It certainly caught my mind, especially lately. I just need it all to stop. Sometimes I can't handle it. So what you're seeing there... Well, I'm not a real person. Oops, hold on. The doc came up. Um, you know, is that the USC School of Social Work, a system for training novice clinicians how to conduct a clinical interview, and in this case, with a possible suicide assessment. And I always like to say it gives novice clinicians a chance to screw up a bunch with a virtual patient before they get their hands on a live one. So we're doing this now with medical students with a wide range of patients. We've got a whole toolkit for this. This guy uses that same kind of AI technology, but was built actually in 2011 for the military as a health a healthcare support agent. Service members coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan, they don't want to see a shrink, you know, it's like I don't have any problems, but they're having issues. So they could go online and interact with this guy, the sim coach, um, and ask questions about PTSD in a conversational mode. Get um, a little bit of advice, do some light screening assessment and get advice. Maybe at the end of a conversation, character might say, hey, looks like you're having some problems. If you want, I can pop up a website on the side. You can punch in your zip code and a list of providers in your area uh, will pop up. So I'll just let him introduce himself real quick. Well, I'm not a real person, if that's what you're asking. But I'm based on the personality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time. So hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. Now this to. is going beyond, I've got five minutes left. This is going beyond um, just military now. We're doing it with the USC Counseling Center. Uh, we've got a whole series of apps that leverage this kind of a software architecture. But generally, when you look at VR, going to the definition now, it's a collection of enabling technologies, whether it's you know, a computer or the computer on a smartphone, um, uh, interface devices, ways to track the user so you can interact, um, and display technology like what you're trying there or a big screen. Um, all with the idea of building simulations that are controllable that you can put people in. Um, I prefer the more human-centric definition, just more natural way to interact with computers and extremely complex data. And if we look at the history of human-computer interaction, maybe it's time we went beyond just limiting ourselves to a mouse and a keyboard for an interface with the power we have. In mental health and rehab, this is the best metaphor, I think. Aviation simulation. Um, you know, just like an aircraft simulator would serve to test and... Oh, hold on, back that up. Just like an, air, a, an aircraft simulator would serve to test and train piloting ability, we can test, train, treat, and teach human function in controlled stimulus environments, the ultimate Skinner box. Um, when we think about VR, think of the three eyes: Immersion, interactivity, and imagination. You don't always need all three, but you need at least two. So, for example, immersion. This is a fellow immersed. You're seeing what he sees as he turns his head in a simulation of an Afghan marketplace. And this is part of an exposure therapy approach. Um, you know, and this is one for physical therapy. Um, come on. There we go. Um, a little sensor on the front of the headset capturing hand movement in real time and allowing that captured hand movement, what you see in the stereo pair there, to interact with graphic objects. And what we've done now is created a whole series of these upper extremity finger therapy applications, but in game-like contexts where you can see your hand in real time, you can interact with the game content, you can do bimanual coordination, a whole range of applications. I'm just going to jump ahead here. You don't need to see the whole thing. Um, interactivity. You don't always need to be immersed. This is a balance training activity. Imagine an elderly person with a safety harness practicing shifting right to left to drive that penguin down a ski slope, an open source free game by the way. Lean forward to go faster, lean back to slow down and do it in a compelling, fun way. It doesn't have to be a penguin. You can catch butterflies. You can do a bunch of stuff. But the idea is 
She's in the lab. She's not immersed in a virtual world. Not needed. And it doesn't always have to come on, be on a big screen. If you build something compelling and engaging, you can get people to do fun stuff. Two minutes, OK. Um, finally, it, with interactivity, come on. Having pro ah, here we go. You can interact with virtual humans through various levels of AI. This is an application we developed for the Dan Marino Foundation. Uh, focusing on high-functioning people on the autism spectrum the for helping them Before practice do, job interview skills, for getting a stuff. job. And we can set, oops, that went ahead here. Oops, sorry about that. You can set these six characters in six different job environments, and they go through a job interview, and you can set them at different levels of provocativeness. So here's this character, this job, soft touch. I'm uh, glad you're here. In a minute, we'll get into some questions about the job. But before we do, why don't you just tell me about yourself? Now, we can take a different character and make it a little harder, different type of job setting. This is an entry-level position. I guarantee there will be things you won't like about this job. <laughs> that said, what's the most important thing you think you're looking for in a job? And she can get crankier. This is just for... <laughs> Showtime consumption. Um, and here's a little bit more on that. The different characters, the different backdrops, and you'll see a user talk about their experience, and I'll be just about done. Um, and here we go. It's a good program, and it teaches you how to do an interview, and it teaches you how to be in an interview situation with another, with another person. And did you see your performance improve? Did it, you get better? I get, I, get, I get better. Every single time I do it, I get better. So that's recent data from a study with this. So to conclude, um, in 1994, VR was used for exposure therapy for specific phobias, heights, fear of flying, and so on. It was easy to do. You just have to make more progressively challenging environments, not much interaction. <laughs> But this is a short list of the areas where VR has shown added value as a tool for assessment, a tool for intervention or treatment, or a tool for scientific study. And I think we have a bright future ahead. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to segue now to our second panel which is how computer science is reinventing psychiatry. So Skip will be joining us again. Um, and then next we have Manman Chowdhury, who is an assistant professor in the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech, where she leads the Social Dynamics and Wellbeing Lab. Her research er interests are in the area of computational social sciences and questions around making sense of human behavior as manifested via our online footprints. And then next we have Sarah Feinberg, who is an instructor in the Yale Department of Psychiatry. She's a psychiatrist with clinical work in public psychiatry. Her patients are people who are underinsured or uninsured in the New Haven community. She's particularly interested in novel approaches to quantifying social learning as it occurs in interactions with her work focusing on borderline personality disorder. So this will be sort of about how not just how technology is influencing the way we treat mental health problems, but even how we think about psychiatry. Um, so Sarah, I'd love to start with you. What exactly is computational psychiatry? Uh, different things to different people, I would say. Um, but one, I'll give you an example, maybe this will help. So uh, we're gonna take now a slightly deeper dive into thinking about the problem of understanding mental health and responding to it. And, one of the things that this will do is talk a little bit about the chemistry of the paint where we started this morning, but also challenge us to move faster on understanding that issue so that we can make use of it and keep the house from burning down. Um, so I'm interested in a condition called borderline personality disorder, which is a sort of devastating disruption of social interaction, which leads to a host of other symptoms, but essentially, I think, is rooted in difficulties in interpersonal communication and perception 
which can lead to immense suffering for the, the afflicted person. And so um, it seems obvious that then we would study the way that someone interacts with someone else. But most of the studies that have looked at social interaction in borderline personality disorder have shown a person a photograph, usually a black and white photograph of a face, and asked, what is this person feeling? What's going on with them? And I just feel so unsatisfied. And I think most people with borderline and other mental health conditions feel so unsatisfied with this as a way of understanding interaction problems. So I've been trying, and I and other people in this field have been trying to move toward thinking about how do we study interaction? So how do we study what happens when you sit down with someone you've never met? And moreover and importantly, what happens as you get to know that person and you need to decide how much to trust them and for what? And when to change your mind about whether to continue trusting them or trusting them so much? And we're able to use complex games that ask people to interact with other people in specific ways to really see what happens as someone has to go through that process. But this requires a fair amount of technology to be able to interpret these, to set up the experiment, to interpret it. And then my hope is eventually to move it into the real world, to ask what happens when you go out and you actually make friends or try to work or, or get along with the people at the doctor's office. And these things are essential to having a full life. So um, that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. But computational psychiatry really refers, I think, more broadly to the use of different kinds of technology, neuroimaging technology, language analytics, um, and also uh, real world ecologic data to try to understand mental illness. Yeah. Munman, what, what's your preferred term for the sort of work that you're doing? Um, I think that would be the closest one. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I haven't uh, settled on a term for it because I think there's just so many opportunities on this field. But um, the way I would describe it is uh, kind of bringing in a lot of the advancements that have been happening in the computer science fields, um, which kind of have been in isolation to a lot of the other uh, possible areas where they can really have an impact, psychiatry being one of it. And uh, thinking about how we can have some of those bear on uh, the challenges, uh, right, starting from uh, diagnosis to understanding to all the way to treatment and intervention, and how at each of these steps we can think about bringing some of these advancements in computation, whether in terms of new kinds of algorithms or whether in terms of new kinds of sources of data, and how that can influence um, and, and, and help with resolving some of these outstanding challenges in psychiatry. So could you give us an example of the sort of projects that you've been working on? Absolutely. Um, so um, my interest has been kind of uh, thinking about um, people's online social interactions. And um, I think about that in two different ways, and, and we touched on that a little bit in the, in the earlier panel, is um, one way to think about it as a, is as a source of data. Um, so as a source of data, it's a, it's a very powerful source, especially for mental illnesses, because the kinds of things that people say and do and the social interactions, all of those are really valuable cues when it comes to, um, comes to understanding or diagnosing somebody's uh, risk or whether they're feeling better or not. So a lot of our research has been kind of on the detection side, thinking about how we can develop new kinds of algorithms that would help us kind of um, discover these kinds of cues about people that may relate to people's mental health status and how we can um, have them provide insights into uh, people who are likely to be at risk going forward or are at risk and we want to help them or see how they're doing over a period of time. And the other way I think about these online social interactions is also um, as kind of what I call uh, community interventions. And um, uh, one of the nicest things about these platforms is that it provides um, a mechanism for people to connect with other people. Uh, and there are all kinds of unintended, unintended good consequences of those possibilities. One of it, um, a very good example, are support groups. Um, online support groups are wonderful, and especially when it comes to something like mental illness, it can be really, really powerful because um, a lot of them provide um, a safe space that we um, also talked about earlier, and also it being very stigmatized for individuals who are not comfortable talking about these issues in other settings, find a way to 
uh, express those thoughts and express those feelings and emotions uh, to an audience who are very likely to understand them because they have either been through that personally or somebody that they know very close friend or family is experiencing that. So I kind of think of it both in terms of uh, these online interactions as a way to uh, understand these mental illnesses, particularly in terms of their interactions and language, and then also in terms of how they can be instrumented to provide support and intervention. Now, and Skip, your work is a little bit different from what Sarah and Manman are working on, but I mean, obviously there's a lot in common as well. Um, I noticed in one of your bios, you said that your goal with virtual reality is to go beyond what is available with traditional 20th century tools and methods. Um, so what exactly are those limits that, you're, that you're, you've come up against and are trying to, well, to be able to? The first part of that quote was to drag psychology kicking and screaming into <laughs> the 21st century. <laughs> um, but, um, well, you know, I think the goal here is to add a level of systematic control of stimulus parameters, but to do that within a real world functional environment. So what you said about the photograph, you know, that's, that's exactly what drove me into VR. I was a, a practitioner in brain injury rehab back in the late 80s, early 90s. And, you know, my clients were, you know, after a head injury, trying to recover their memory, attention, so on, working with workbook exercises, paper and pencil stuff. Stuff that would, you're asking somebody to do the thing they can't and do it in a boring fashion. And uh, so, you know, that's what spurred on the idea about use game based stuff, but also put people in immersive environments. Um, as well, what you were mentioning about, um, you know, reality mining, you know, measuring people's interaction using, you know, advanced data mining, you know, of, of naturalistic behaviors. Well, this is stuff that, you know, we try to do but in a simulated context with a virtual human. Uh, we find that, that people interacting with a virtual character, contrary to what you might expect, sometimes feel more comfortable talking to a piece of software. Um, we actually done controlled studies where you have a person go in and there's a, a clinical interviewer agent, and you tell one group that it's just software. You're not gonna have a human in the loop. The other group is told there's a Wizard of Oz controller driving the avatar in the other room in real time. And you find people feel more comfortable with the AI agent. They talk longer, they answer more questions, they feel, have less ratings of worry about impression management risk, um, and they, they self-disclose more information and reveal more incidents of, of sadness um, or sad events. Um, and so we're able to look at not just what they say also, but how they say it. Analyze vocal prosody, the hesitancy, the, if they look down when they get answered. And so there's such a rich amount of data that we can get about a person from these kinds of interactions that may be destigmatizing. People aren't worrying about being judged. They can talk freely. Um, so, I mean, I, whether you're using VR or you're analyzing online, um, uh, content or interacting with an agent, um, you know, I, we, we have a whole new future ahead. I mean, and we're, it's going to, you know, you think psychology is science only been around 100, 125 years um, studying human behavior and interaction in the real world. We're going to need some time now to study human interaction and behavior now in the virtual world, the digital world. You, you Google all sorts of health symptoms. You might be embarrassed to ask your doctor about. Yes. At least I have in my life. Um, so one thing that's interesting about psychiatry is that while it's, it's a science, when it comes to diagnosing someone, there's so much subjectivity. You know, so in some ways, could the, the big data analytics that you guys are working on help clarify lines between diagnoses or even create new diagnoses? I think there's a possibility that we'll revise our diagnostic nosology. Um, at this point, we have very little underlying reason to think that the categories that we use and adhere to are real in any kind of uh, biological sense, at least. Um, however, it's very important for us to come to a consensus about what's what so that we can talk to each other and do studies that can be replicated. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm very hopeful that um, new approaches to looking at big data will help us figure out categories that are 
more predictive of what will go on over time and, and how someone will respond to treatment and cause us to spend less time dragging people through treatments that are ultimately ineffective. So I, I can add to that a little bit. Um, I think one of the biggest um, uh, p potential of big data is, is the idea that it can be, um, uh, various things can be measured objectively from it and it can be, those things can be measured in a granularity that is very difficult to do with like uh, survey instruments, which are really good, well validated, and they've been in use for many, many decades now, but then people get tired of doing surveys, and you can't give them surveys very frequently, but they are very important to um, chalk out that treatment plan, so how do we do it? And, and that's where the big data and, and all of the things that can be had from big data can be really powerful because without um, the person being actively engaged, you can gather some of those uh, measurements in a granularity and a longitudinal fashion and, and to even use them to do predictive stuff. So like uh, forecasting things that are in the future that haven't happened. And that's kind of one of the biggest potential of these kinds of methods. Right, and you've worked with, um, with tracking people who are postpartum, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how, how does that, how has that sort of worked in your approach? Yeah, so um, we were um, really, um, uh, you know, surprised in a, in a positive way to see that if you were just looking at uh, the Facebook uh, data of uh, pregnant women over their course of pregnancy, you, and you can build a predictive model by looking at those language markers and other measures of interaction and predict whether they are t likely to be at risk of postpartum depression before it even happens to them. So like you didn't have to even wait for the onset of the, of the condition and you could make a prediction um, with pretty good confidence before, before that. And I think these kinds of more proactive approaches uh, to mental health uh, are going to be really helpful um, for us going forward. It's, I mean, I know Facebook and Twitter, for instance, have tried to look into ways to use algorithms to perhaps flag people who might be at risk of, of suicide. Um, I know of someone who was once flagged as a potential suicide risk by peers and then was very upset when Facebook told her someone had done that. I mean, how, how do you approach someone and say, my algorithm is telling me that you might be at risk of postpartum depression? Is, the prediction sort of hard to communicate to potential patients? Very hard, and, and it raises lots of, we talked about privacy a little bit earlier, I think it raises ethical questions um, when you have these algorithms uh, making these inferences which typically are made by therapists and clinicians. So I think, you know, these are, these are the nuances that we need to think about, like now that we have shown some feasibility, like some proof of concept projects across the board that these things are possible, how do you actually take them and help people? In my opinion, I think, you know, in the near future, the most um, benefit we are going to get is probably um, to empower the clinicians and therapists with these algorithms instead of um, other entities engaging with people directly with those inferences. So, you know, we talked a little bit on the last panel about scalability. Um, so in your wildest dreams, are these algorithms something that Facebook would run themselves or, or you know, Twitter and other social networks would, would run or would they only be responsive to clinicians or should Twitter be hiring clinicians? Like, can we actually get VR in almost every setting? Where, where how do we sort of, take this research and make it more widely available? Um, I'll start with Skip and VR maybe. Uh, well, you know, I think we're at the very beginning stages, but, um, you know, there's been a little bit of a backlash against some of this stuff recently, and, and some of it's well-informed, some of it's neo-Ludditeism, I think. Um, but, you know, our, our behavior in these, these social uh, media settings are always being monitored, and we're being pitched products. Why not be pitched the product of mental health? So with the, I think you're referring to Chris Poulin's work with the suicide stuff on Facebook. Well, maybe you don't send the person a warning message. You know, you're <laughs> going to commit suicide. Run to your, your shrink, you know. Maybe, you know, some of the ads that pop up are, you know, about, you know, self-help or 
you know, providing options that, you know, under the radar, give the person a message that there's hope. So, you know, I think the, the key in under, one of the keys in understanding how this stuff can work is, and I think you alluded to it, with, we're not make, using these things for decision making, we're using it for decision support. So a clinician gets this extra information that they wouldn't be privy to um, just from talking to the person for an hour once a week. You know, they're getting an additive information and any good diagnosis and guidance for treatment involves multiple strands of evidence that inform your cl clinical decision making. So this is stuff that's not going to replace a clinician. It's going to help us to do our jobs better with better information. And I think that, you know, the problem is with, you know, doing online, there's got to be money involved. Who's going to make money on it and all that? Are we a more noble society that puts this stuff in because Zuckerberg believes it's going to have a healthier population and sell more product? You know, or, you know I think it will happen, um, it, but it's going to be an incremental thing, and there'll be missteps along the way. When you make this, this point about decision versus decision support, especially around suicide assessment and prediction, I think it's important to actually underline the point about how little success we have in predicting suicide attempts and suicide completion and how very much we'd like to get better at that. And so I think that, you know, at this point, I think most clinicians have a no better than chance uh, prediction rate. And so we're doing badly. And uh, we need to get much, much better at this. And I think we're trying a variety of approaches, but, but any, any little help that was data-based and effective would be an enormous benefit to uh, clinician-patient efforts to collaborate on preventing um, self-harm. Any thoughts, Mandan? Absolutely. I think uh, I, I emphasize uh, the word uh, empower here. I think mm -hmm. it just echoed from all of the uh, panel members. I think we are not, we are not saying that Clinicians, uh, clinicians are no longer read, needed, but, but rather how can we empower them? And it would actually tackle some of the scalability things that we talked in the morning uh, panel as well, that there are so few um, uh, therapists and using VR and using big data to kind of um, help them um, look at more cases in a shorter amount of, limited amount of time, I think that would really uh, uh, be a promising future. So one question on a sort of separate subject um, is something that John wrote about in his Slate piece a bit, which is that a lot of the research here involves recruiting um, research participants from things like Mechanical Turk. You know, is that a limit to, to this? Like, is there a way to expand the pool of participants beyond um, Mechanical Turk? I'm excited to be able to get people <laughs> to Mechanical Turk. So I, I mean, I, y yes, I hope so. And also I think that, um, uh, you know, if we want to do a behavioral study of people with a mental health condition and some controls in the lab, depending on resources, it could take us several years to collect a minimal size sample. Um, and uh, I recently had an experience where I replicated a minimal size human sample. And I'd very much enjoyed meeting each of those people, and I really felt I'd had an interaction with them. But then I tried the study on, on Mechanical Turk, and I was able to, in three months, collect 3,000 people. And that changes the confidence I have about my conclusions. And I'm able to, by using several different self-report surveys that examine the same construct, really get a sense that I really am studying people who really do have this condition and who, you know, uh, and I can collect language data mm -hmm. from them and I can do psychological tasks. And uh, I think the idea would be to, yeah, go even bigger, get, get my task into an app that we can deploy much more broadly or at clinical settings across the country where uh, clinicians maybe have seen and diagnosed the people in real time. And I think there, there's, there's a, an idea here of not just deploying therapeutics, but also deploying research so that we get a much broader sample and, a, and people who might not be on MTurk or who might, uh, of, of note, it does seem like there's a really pretty robust clinical population of people on MTurk, uh, perhaps because MTurk's a good thing to do if you're having a harder time. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think about yeah, broadening? Yeah, I mean, I think MTurk is already a huge um, step forward. Yeah, and I'm sorry. Does everyone know what Mechanical Turk is? Yeah. I, I glossed past that. Okay. Um, would one of you like to explain? Uh, so um, one of the problems that we have is, is 
sort of growing our database of people who would like to and are able to participate in studies. And there are various things that keep people from participating in studies, uh, getting to the lab, hearing about the study, feeling well enough to come in, feeling well enough to come back, um, wanting to meet psychiatrists or come into a mental health hospital, for goodness sake. So um, Mechanical Turk is a, a large user community on Amazon.com that um, anybody with a credit card can become a member of. and. Um, there are, I think, millions of people participating now, and uh, a lot of, they're all over the world, but you can uh, restrict the task that you need done to people based on various attributes, gender, previous participation, ge geography, um, age. And um, it uh, is excellent for doing big jobs that need to be done by people. So say that a simple thing would be, say that you need to identify a certain object in photos that's better done by people than a computer at this point, and you have gazillions of photos and you want to get it done quickly, you can put this task for a small amount of money on MTurk and lots of people will try it and do it and you can get duplicates and you can get the task done in a few days when otherwise it would have been impossible. And so running a psychological task now, you know, 100 people will do it in an afternoon and you're done. <laughs> and um, that's a miracle. And how much would you say someone gets paid to do the test, it's like cents, right? This is a point of controversy. Okay. So some MTurk workers, um, there's a large community of MTurk workers who feel this is work and should be paid at minimum wage. And some people do agree to do that. Um, I would say general pay is probably more like 50 cents to a dollar an mm -hmm. hour. I'm sorry, and I'm on back to what you're, the point you were making before. <laughs> that's a, that's a, we missed that point, so I'm glad that we uh, brought up what it is. Yeah, so I think these kind of crowd marketplaces like Mechanical Turk are already kind of um, uh, revolutionizing a lot of fields where typically we have been, uh, uh, we have had a model where people would come in into a research lab and would do studies. So, um, uh, I, I mean, I think these things are gonna get bigger and bigger going forward. And also, uh, again, going back to, to online resources, that's another place where we can get access uh, to otherwise harder to reach populations, um, which would be difficult uh, from a research study perspective. I, I think with Mechanical Turk it would be great, the ultimate big data thing would be to look at a user on that and be able to access all the previous data mm -hmm. uh, they did or have them take baseline yeah. tests so that you have some quantification besides age and gender. Uh, I mean, we, we use Craigslist to try to uh, solicit people to come into the lab for sometimes for our normal control group uh, comparing with uh, the pop clinical populations. And we have to do screening, you know, when they come in because a lot of times the Craigslist people are not necessarily in the category <laughs> of the normal control group. Um, so, you know, we, we did a study looking at anxiety, PTSD, and depression, and we had to do, when they came into the lab, you know, we assume they're normal, they're going to be in contrast with patient groups, but we have, have to have them do screening tests. And a lot of people that are kind of professional Craigslist research. Sometimes they're a little shaky. <laughs> uh, no offense if you're <laughs> out there, but you know, so. But this may be another place where technology can help us, you know? Like one group that I work with pushes surveys to people ahead of time, yeah. right? And they be, exactly. we don't then trouble them to spend their time to come into the lab. We don't spend an afternoon doing an assessment um, if we're able to look at those results, and it gives us the first pass. So when you guys look at media coverage of the kind of work you're doing, what's what sort of concerns you? What do you think that people are starting to misunderstand about this field? I can say a couple of words yeah. on that. Um, so I think um, there are, you can interpret that in two different ways. Um, I think there is, a, there is a lot of enthusiasm in the, in the press um, that uh, computational psychiatry is a thing, that computer science can indeed uh, revolutionize uh, mental health and other uh, other challenges um, that you know are still outstanding pretty much all over the world um, but um, you know there's also um, uh, this this over uh, enthusiasm can also um, signal uh, some some things that are not um, true um, so I think we are, like I said, we are seeing a lot of things that are possible, but I don't think these technologies are in a place where they are a part of uh, the, the, the clinical paradigm. I mean, that is 
um, you know, a little while away. Uh, and before we reach there, one of the things that I, I always think that we, I wish we were a little bit careful in terms of the kind of, kinds of stories that we are sharing with the, with the broader world. Um, that's something I noticed. Yeah. I mean, and you've seen the hype cycle come and go with yeah. VR. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, you know, if you, as brought up in the last panel about awareness, the media is great for this. Uh, the, on the good side, is two of the first levels of breaking down barriers to care is awareness and anticipated benefit. Mm -hmm. You can have the best treatment in the world, but if people aren't aware of it and don't think it's going to help them, they're not going to access it. So media does a good job of that. But by the same token, sometimes nobody wants to hear that, just like uh, journals, nobody wants to publish the negative findings, you know, and nobody wants to cover unless it's a horrific negative finding that you could <laughs> publish. You know, so the media looks for success stories, and that's good, and it builds awareness and positive anticipation. But, you know, sometimes there's things that, um, you know, when I get interviewed and get a, uh, you know, a big media hit of CNN or, you know, Washington Post, some, get a ton of calls the next day, where can I get this PTSD treatment, or I get a kid with autism, it's like, whoa, this is a research study now, and we got some preliminary data that's real positive. Um, and sometimes that gets left out of the story, you know. Or if you're doing anything with a virtual human coach or, you know, a healthcare guide or concierge, if you will, it gets written up a virtual clinician, <laughs> virtual therapist. You know, it's like, no, we're not there yet. <laughs> right? or not, not even yet. No. But, you know, I, you, just the rough and tumble part of it that I think in the end ultimately is good. It's getting new ideas into the, the public consciousness, but you have to temper it sometimes. My apologies on behalf of the media. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no apologize yeah. for it. Did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I guess I was musing a little bit about our discussion earlier about stigma and, and peer support and uh, I think that technology has been really, really important and I agree with what's been said already about the importance of sort of bolstering and even creating new peer support communities uh, across um, uh, the mental health community. And I sometimes wonder if the complexity of thinking about how to be in the world as a person with mental health challenges or to be a provider and sort of think about a comprehensive treatment plan that takes into account questions about peer support, questions about expertise, questions about medication, um, questions about therapy. I wonder if that complexity can get lost as we sort of jump on the bandwagon about met a new medication or a new chatbot or a new or a new peer support approach. And I, I sometimes think that what I would really like to see is more conversation about how we can, I, I, I really, really loved your question because you asked, where can, as I understood it, where do, where do um, peers and people with lived experience fit into and integrate into research studies, not here's the research and here's the peer support somewhere. And I think sometimes there's a false wall um, that, that it's, it's really our work to, to be taking that apart. And I, I hope the media can help us with, with talking about how the, the efforts we're doing to do that and how we want to do it more and better. Um, yeah. And that's a great segue into questions. Um, does anyone have a question? Thank you all so much. This has been really terrific. Um, my name is Jessica, and as someone who um, was a former NIMH research fellow, um, currently develops products for the American Psychological Association, also worked in startups and venture capital, everything that you've talked about today has really resonated. Um, so in working with a lot of technologists, I found that they can tend to overestimate the um, ease with which therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists can find uh, these types of products, services, um, technologies, and also the ease with which they can understand them. Because just speaking um, in generalities, they are people who have spent most of their life in the social sciences, not necessarily learning um, how to be fluent in technology. So what do you see as sort of um, uh, the, the communication gap that needs to be overcome um, in terms of developing that fluency and also where are the places that they can look to um, sort of find these, these studies, these technologies, um, if it's not already sort of in their uh, sphere? Um, 
So really, really important question, and I find myself thinking about them too, um, coming from the other side, the computer technology side. I think there is indeed um, not enough avenues for the two communities to intermingle. I mean, this is an exception. I'm so grateful that this is happening. We need more events like this, more gatherings like this, where the communities can come together and exchange notes and whatnot. But at the same time, I, I think even from a, there is a research angle to it too. So a lot of the algorithms or the language analytic tools that are uh, developed um, um, are kind of fairly opaque to anybody who is not an expert in those things. And usually that is fine, but it, we are talking about a context in which um, the therapists or even the patients, talking about empowering the patients uh, themselves, they need to know how these things work because they need to know how is it this algorithm is uh, inferring, looking at these patterns in my language or, or looking at the way I behave, how is it that it's coming up with these estimates? And currently, there is very little that we can do to help them through these questions. So I think an important research area, which is kind of emerging in, a, in, a, in somewhere else, but I think that's relevant here also, it's called machine learning interpretability. So how can you incorporate transparency, interpretability, into these kinds of technologies so that the people who are, at the end of the day, are the people who are going to benefit from them, they can understand and they can trust these technologies um, in, in a real scenario. Sarah, let's get in front. Uh, you know, I, th I think your point um, is well taken here that how do you, how do you go from bed to, uh, bench to bedside, uh, you know, and how does the, the investment community drive something so people make money at the same time they're doing their funding work that is advanced. I think we really need to, to, to be very basic here and say, you know, what does the, the science tell us? What's the, what's the extant literature uh, in support of some of this stuff? I mean, I, I, in VR, I mean, in the last two years, there's been more VR mental health startups than in the previous 20. And a lot of them come out of the game ecosystem, game developers, you know, seeing that this might be a hot area. And it's like, well, in that ecosystem, you build a cool game, people li like it, they pay to play, and you're a success. When you're building apps or VR environments or whatever with technology, you've got to appeal to a higher standard. You know, you need, you need the data to support what you're doing. And I think that's where the app area ran into a lot of trouble. People just came up Oh, mindfulness. Oh, cure your depression. I mean, it's like you know uh, the the digital um, Barnes and Noble self help section. You know, um, you know, for better or worse. I mean, we we can't. You know, we just have to. We have to. VCs have got to look at the data. Uh, other questions? I'm Atha Agao. I'm with the Cybersecurity Initiative here at New America. Thank you so much for your thought-provoking remarks. I'm wondering uh, if we could look forward maybe 10 or 15 years and if uh, the panelists could offer their vision of a best-case scenario as it applies to their own work um, or more broadly of the technology integration with your work. Um, and if you feel like it, maybe offer a worst case scenario. <laughs> and if you have time, um, what would be the sign points along the way that we were heading down one of those directions? Who wants to start? <laughs> um, one thing we didn't touch on this morning that I'm excited about is real-time feedback. Um, and uh, this has been done for quite a long time in, in terms of biofeedback, so uh, attaching the equivalent of a lie detector to someone and measuring their sort of excitement or upset as they do various things or exposed to various things. Uh, we're starting to move into doing neurofeedback, and I think uh, we're on the edge of doing real-time feedback about language analytics. I think the language stuff is particularly exciting because it's uh, – at least from a physical perspective, non-invasive, uh, we would want to be cautious for all the reasons we've discussed about the psychological and ethical intrusiveness. But um, I, so I, I think real-time feedback is one exciting direction, which may yield um, uh, faster results and may help with things like um, in-the-room modulation of therapeutic alliance, which we know to be the strongest predictor of therapeutic success in psychotherapy. Um, 
Uh, trouble, I think we've, we've talked a lot about trouble this morning in terms of um, access to unreliable tools and leading people down potentially destructive paths. I think that um, one of the things that expertise may provide and partly through training but also through being really someone outside of the situation is um, the ability to help someone know um, are you someone who's likely to benefit from this particular kind of situation or are you likely to be hurt? Um, one of the ways um, that the condition that I'm interested in, borderline personality disorder, was initially diagnosed was that people actually got worse in therapies that helped other people. And so I think it is important to be clear, you know, all, all mental health problems aren't made alike, just as our, all people aren't made alike. And we want to be attentive to individuals, but also the, the specifics of a situation. And I think um, one worry I had is people uh, self-diagnosing or diagnosing with their friends and, and maybe being exposed to treatments that may not be right for them and may actually lead them to a lot of expense or, 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 um, or emotional hurt as they, as they try to engage. So I'll quickly add, I think in terms of a positive uh, vision, I, I see that um, you know, 15 years down the lane, hopefully we'll be a little bit, we'll have a more proactive attitude to, to uh, helping people instead of a reactive ones. Um, and I think that'll, that'll be a, a game changer in this field, especially talking about adverse outcomes like suicides. Um, at the same time, um, one of the challenges is also that if we are, um, if, if technology is, is such an, in, it becomes such an integral part of the uh, paradigm, then a risk that we run into is, uh, we talked about people gaming technology. So sometimes it's intentional, but sometimes it can be unintentional as well. Uh, for instance, if somebody drops using all of these technologies and our entire system is dependent upon looking at those cues, then we kind of, lose that person, lose contact with that person, and that can be really dangerous. So I think what is important to balance is to take what is the most powerful about these technologies and, uh, and use them to, to bolster and make the current paradigm ba better instead of using it as a replacement. Uh, you know, I think uh, the, the bright future is the, um, the, the use, the integrated use of a lot of these technologies. Um, kind of all put together, um, the current generation who grew up with an iPad in their hand at three years old, um, it will come to expect uh, this being part of their health uh, healthcare. Um, and, and that's all good, and technology's making it in our area with the VR. You know, these things eventually are gonna be like toasters. Everyone's gonna have a VR system in their home. Might not use it every day, but you got it there. So there'll be widespread access, there'll be integration of the AI, the online behavior analysis, all, you know, tracking behavior, all, all these things come, come together. The downside, I think, is what you said, is that it may lead to a, um, a tendency for people to think they can self-diagnose and self-treat. And um, I'm, I recently wrote a piece with the uh, IEEE uh, AI uh, framework for ethical use of technology. And that is the primary concern, I think. Um, you know, it's sort of like if you're a, if you get arrested for something and you decide to defend yourself, not going to be a lawyer. The old saying is, "He who has uh, used, used oh, how does it go? Uh, um, he who defends himself in a court of law has a fool for a lawyer and a fool for a client." Um, well, I think it's no less important <laughs> for self-diagnosis and self-treatment. Uh, I think you still need well-trained professionals to guide the use of these things. You can push more independent use, but I think it still needs to be supervised by um, a practicing clinician, a well-trained clinician. We have time for one more question. Oh, we don't have time for one more question. I'm sorry. Um, speakers might be around for another minute <laughs> if you do. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. Um, we really appreciate it. <laughs> If you're interested in our upcoming events, please um, visit the New America website where you can register and follow us on Twitter at Future Tense Now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.